Hey everyone, my name is Brittany and I know John and Nancy because I worked with them at a church out in the San Francisco Bay Area. And my husband is also on the Become New team. He works behind the scenes and so you'll see me from time to time on these videos. And um, I'm excited to just take us way back for my favorite to the Ashes to Beauty series. I love that whole series. Um, it kind of starts out with the celebration of personal inadequacy. And at the time, John had like a procedure done and he has a big bandage on his forehead. And I think it just like goes with the whole series so perfectly. Um, and I've come back to that concept many times of just, it's okay to celebrate my own personal inadequacy. But the video I chose for you today is Good Enough Faith. And I just love that John talks about how Abraham kind of wrestled with God and doubted and really screwed up the whole plan time and time again. And yet it was enough for God to call Abraham a friend. And um, I think that that just settles my own heart when I have those same questions and wonder like, am I really doing the plan of God in my life? And, um, is who I am and what I'm bringing enough. And so I hope you enjoy this video as much as I did. Here's John. I want to talk to you today about good enough faith, not heroic faith, not saintly faith, not ideal perfect faith, just good enough. What is that? We're on this journey from ashes to beauty, to God, to Easter, to life. And where it starts is the recognition, I am not adequate. We celebrate the recognition of personal inadequacy. You are inadequate too. And then we come to believe that there is one who is adequate. There is one who is all powerful and he is God and he would help us. But how much do you have to believe that? I'm talking about good enough faith today. It's a phrase that comes from a British psychiatrist, Donald Willicott, who used to talk about the good enough parent, not the perfect, not a great, not a heroic parent, somebody who's good enough that they can raise a well-adjusted child who can deal with what he calls the catastrophic loss of the sense of omnipotence. My parents aren't perfect, family's not perfect, but it's okay. And I know the pain of uh, being racked by the torment of that question, was I a good enough dad? And so this question of what is good enough faith is real important. And I want to look at it by telling you a story. Parts of it you might know. Parts of it you might never have thought about before. Real famous character in the Bible. His name was Abraham. As you may know, the three great monotheistic religions in the world, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all look to Abraham as their father. He's kind of a poster boy for living by faith. So how much faith did he have? How much is good enough? Now, Abraham had a heart's desire, and his heart's desire, we all have a heart's desire, was to be a patriarch, the head of a great tribe, a great clan. That sounds a little odd to us, but in the ancient world, it was very much the equivalent of wanting to be the CEO of a great startup, the head of the next Apple or Google or Facebook or whatever. He wanted this more than he wanted anything. And so God comes to him one day, and God gives him a promise and a command. The promise is he's going to get his heart's desire. He will be the head of a great uh, nation, which will bless all the peoples on the earth. Unbelievable scale. And the command is, I want you to go. I want you to leave your home, your country, your father's household, and go to the place that I will show you. Pretty ambiguous information will be given on a need-to-know basis. And Abraham leaves. He actually does what God says. Now, there's a contrast with his father, Terah, we're told earlier, had left Ur, where Abraham was from, and set out for Canaan, where Abraham was to go. But when he reached Haran, he settled there. The story doesn't tell exactly, but it may well be that he was not willing to go all the way to the place where God wanted for his new community to begin. But Abraham went, and that was good enough for God. However, we find immediately, I'm indebted to Eleanor Stump for a lot of these observations, uh, the introduction of another theme, which is that Abraham is double-minded. Abraham doubts. Abraham is quite fickle. And we see this because when he leaves, he brings not just his wife, Sarah, but his nephew, Lot. Now, he was supposed to leave his father's household. Lot was part of his father's household. Why would Abraham bring Lot? Well, 
Abraham's 75 years old and it occurs to him, you know, I, I'm not sure about this. I don't know that this is going to work. I don't think Medicare covers Viagra. And so Lot was like plan B. In case God's plan doesn't work, if I can't have lots of children, maybe I could have Lot's children. And so over the course of time, things do not work out well with Lot. The land is not big enough to accommodate them and their flocks and their herds and the economy or agriculture or events, or maybe God causes it that Lot must leave. So it's clear, not going to be plan B, not going to be Lot. And God comes back to Abraham and makes things a little clearer. This land that you're looking at now, it'll be this land and your offspring. And more time passes, but still no child. When God returns, Abraham says, what gift do you want to give to me and Eleazar, my servant, who I have named my heir? Now, why would you name your servant your heir? Well, because you think that you are not going to have any biological children to be your heir. And God says, no, 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 not Lot, but also not Eleazar. It will be the offspring of your own body. Makes it a little clearer. More time passes. Still no child. By now, Sarah is 75 years old, and her biological clock stopped ticking a long time ago. So she says to Abraham, I got a great idea. Why don't I give you my maidservant, Hagar, and you can have a child by her? And then, so now this becomes plan D. And quite passively, Abraham says, well, sounds like a good idea to you. Okay. And he and Hagar have a son named Ishmael. And uh, the story becomes a hot mess from there. And Sarah eventually says, this is not working out. Get rid of that kid. And God comes back to Abraham and says, it's not going to be Lot. It's not going to be Eleazar. It's not going to be Ishmael. You can have Ishmael and Hagar leave. I will take care of them. I will be with them. I will give a child to you and Sarah. And God does. And if you know the story, then you know that's Abraham's son, Isaac, and through some very dramatic moments, Isaac grows up and everybody lives happily ever after. Except, 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 I had never noticed this part of the story before. When we think that Abraham has achieved the pinnacle of faith and trusting God and so, and Isaac is a grown man and uh, he is married off to a wonderful, virtuous, beautiful woman named Rebecca. Sarah dies and Abraham marries again a woman named Keturah. And they have not one, not two, but six children, all of them boys. Why do they do this? Well, it turns out that uh, although Isaac is a strapping boy, he does not get married to Rebecca until he's 40 years old. And then when they get married, they do not have any children for a year, for two years, for a decade, for 20 years. And so it seems to be the case that Abraham says to himself, well, I'm not so sure about this. You know, I didn't just want to have a son. I want to be a patriarch. And if it's not going to happen with Isaac, so he takes another wife and he has six more boys. This is now plan D, E, F, G, H, and I. And it's not until Isaac and Rebecca finally have twin boys, Jacob and Esau, and those boys get old enough so that it's clear that the line will continue the tribe will increase. Abraham finally can see his way to his heart's desire that we're told he gives the other six boys with Keturah parting gifts. Here's your consolation prize and sends them to the east and names Isaac as his heir. Make sure that he's going to get everything. In other words, even after everything had happened and Isaac had come along and Abraham had trusted God. He is still double-minded. He is still not sure. He is still making backup plans. He's got enough faith to leave when God calls him to leave. Doesn't have enough faith to wait. And yet, his faith is good enough for God to work with. Now, an obvious question when you look at this story is, why in the world didn't God give Abraham more detail in the beginning? It would have kept Abraham from making all these mistakes and trying to follow all these backup plans. Why didn't God come to him in Genesis 12, where it all starts, and say, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and all the peoples through the earth will be blessed through you. And it's going to take about a quarter of a century. And it's not going to be through Hagar and not Lot and not Eleazar. It's going to be through Sarah, and his name will be called Isaac. And so why didn't God just make it clear? I know of a man, an engineer, 
uh, whose favorite saying is, ambiguity is not your friend. Apparently, God disagrees with that. Apparently, it turns out that strategic ambiguity is indispensable to the formation of character. Apparently, Abraham is going to grow if he has to struggle and wrestle and not understand and make mistakes and come to a clearer understanding of God and form judgment and character. Abraham will grow and develop much more through ambiguity than he would have if he had just gotten a crystal clear blueprint from the very beginning. We get a guide, not a map. Somebody wrote a long time ago, your car's headlights only project about 15 feet into the distance, but that'll be enough to get you home. That'll be enough to get you home. So that's good enough faith. Not perfect, not ideal. Abraham was willing to rely on God, to trust God, and God was content to accept that in the place of Abraham's perfection. So now today, uh, accept, aim at good enough faith. Don't expect quick. Don't expect clear. Don't expect easy. Don't give up. Don't give out. Don't quit. Today, in the middle of ambiguity, just say, God, I'm relying on you. You can name all those places where you would like to have more clarity and say, God, I am trusting that even in the midst of this, you are at work and I will do the best I can as you help me. I will ask for clarity, but I will live with it. I will accept it if you don't give me clarity, and I will receive patience. And if I can't be patient on my own, I will ask for your help. Today, aim at good enough faith. Not perfect, not ideal, good enough faith. Because that's when you lean into grace. See, the wonderful thing about Abraham is, even when... You know, it seems like the moral of the story is done and Isaac showed up and the flannel graph board is put away. He's still fickle. He's still double-minded. But God's faithfulness is greater than Abraham's fickleness. And he's called a friend of God. That's grace. And the six boys, those six sons of Keturah that came after Ishmael and after Isaac, well, it turns out they all became patriarchs too. They all had a great story with God on their own as well. And that's grace too. That's grace too. It's all grace. And that's the story of the gospel according to the eight sons of Abraham. That's good enough faith. And oh man, are we going to need that tomorrow. I will see you then. Hey, thanks for joining us at becomenew.me. I'm Tim. And we're a community that's learning together how to grow spiritually one day at a time. So you can expect to receive about 10 minutes of teaching Monday through Friday here, all about how to prioritize the person you're becoming. If you want to make sure and never miss an episode, you can text the word become to the number 855-888-0444, or you can email us at becomenew.me at gmail.com. Also, if you want prayer or to connect someone with someone on our team, you can reach out at those sources as well. This is our last week of favorites. We got a few more guests coming up and then we're gonna end with your favorite episode on Friday. So stay tuned for that. See you then.